Greetings, friends. Welcome to another ministry of the Victory Hour. The Victory Hour is a ministry brought here on YouTube by the Lord's people at Clavel Assembly in Foster, Rhode Island. We are a local assembly in in Rhode Island, in Foster, Rhode Island, and we are a body of believers. We are independent, and we believe the Bible is the inspired, inerrant Word of God. We believe that salvation is by God's grace through faith in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. The only way a person can have their sins forgiven is by repenting of their sins and throwing themselves at the mercy of God, trusting in the shed blood of Jesus Christ and the cross of Calvary as the substitutionary payment for their sins and depending on God's good grace and his gift in Christ for their salvation. Now, when that happens, that only happens because God draws his people to the truth of the gospel. It is divine intervention. It is, at the moment of conversion, irresistible grace. That's right, it is, at the moment of conversion. It's the irresistible grace of God being brought on a person in his mercy towards them. God draws them to his Son. They receive Christ as their Savior, and the Spirit of God comes and indwells them and changes their hearts and now draws them to the person of Christ and enables us to believe and really to obey. Not that we're perfect. We still struggle with bodies of flesh. And so is a war between the flesh and the spirit. But we have new hearts now. That's why we have such victory in our lives after conversion, because God has done something for us. He's made us new creatures in Christ. Yes, we believe what the scripture teaches about the gospel. And we're not ashamed of it. And if anybody that has struggles with the reality of where you truly stand with God, I mean, do you know that you've been born again? Do you know if you've genuinely received Christ as your Savior? And that which I have described has come to pass in your own life? you got any questions about salvation, I want you to contact me. You can do that through the internet, info, email me, info at clavelassembly.com, info at clavelassembly.com, or you can write to me, The Victory Hour, P.O. Box 222, Foster, Rhode Island, 02825, or you can address it to Clavel Assembly, it'll end up in the same place, Clavel Assembly, P.O. Box 222, Foster, Rhode Island, 02825. All right. This is Jim Gallagher. I'm the pastor of uh, Clavel Assembly. Thank you for joining our YouTube channel. Now, we've been talking about the prophetic heavens and earth. I've given four pots on that. You know what? I can give more pots. I could give several more pots, but I think I'll just leave it there for now because my intent isn't to go into it with all the detail that I could, but enough to make you say, oh, wait a minute there. There's a point to be made here. I think I've done that. For instance, I haven't gone into the subject of the Jews themselves have always considered the structure of the temple as a reflection of the heavens and earth. Did you know that? They believe that the design of the temple that was destroyed in 70 AD reflected the heavens and the earth. So when the Lord came back in 70 AD, Jesus Christ came back and judged Israel and destroyed the temple. He was destroying the heavens and the earth, the metaphoric heavens and and the earth, which is symbolic of Old Covenant Israel, and is also portrayed in the temple in Jerusalem. I haven't even gotten into all that part of it. There's other things I could bring up, but I'm going to leave it for now. I'm going to leave it for now. And I I actually want to take a break from talking about eschatology, because this channel is not meant to be just eschatology. But I wanted to bring it up to up front, and when I bring up front what we believe, I've got to give a little bit of context. There's so much more that I will give you in time, God willing. There's so much more. I've got over five years of preaching on it on our website, clavelassembly.com. So there's a lot to talk about. And I think you get a lot of questions. Hey, wait a minute. Every eye shall see him, right? How could that have happened in 70 AD? Oh, we're supposed to meet the clouds, uh, the Lord in the clouds in the air. Uh, how, how did that happen in 7 AD? Look, I understand all those questions. I had them at one time too. 
But I came to find out by believing the words of Jesus, by believing the words of John the Baptist, by believing the words of every New Testament author concerning the soon return of Christ, all these answers start flooding in. The just shall live by faith. And if we want the blessing of God in our understanding of Scripture, we need to believe it as it is written within the context in which it is given, not through the filter of our own wisdom. That's how you come up with bad hermeneutics, too. Well, be that as it may, um, so I do want to take a break. There's so much I want to talk about. This, this vote, you know, the vote with Kevin McCarthy for House Speaker. Boy, I'd like to talk about that. You know, the representative from Texas, Chip Roy, huh, go watch his clips on YouTube. He's coming out with both guns blazing. I like the man. <laughs> I really do. He's a patriot, and he's doing what is honorable as a representative of his constituents there in Texas. I wish we had some like that in Rhode Island, but we don't. You say, well, what does that have to do with the gospel in the, in the, in the Christian ministry? <laughs> you know, it's a portrait of where the society is at morally, spiritually. But I'm not going to take time to do that now. I do want to take a break from eschatology, but before I do, I want to do both postings this week. I want to talk about one more subject than eschatology. Then we'll take a break from it for a little bit, and then we'll hit it here and there as the Lord leads. But this week, I'd like to talk about who is Mystery Babylon? Who is Mystery Babylon? If my contention is correct, and Christ returned in 66 to 70 AD in the war on Jerusalem, where the old covenant system was eliminated and destroyed by divine providence through the power of Jesus Christ, who returned in the glory of his Father, Exactly when he said he would. See, all those things are true. If that's true, what I'm contending here, <clears throat> then the whole thing with the Antichrist and Mystery Babylon had to have taken place, well, in the first century. So, yet another way to prove the first century Parousia return of Christ. And actually, this is a pretty straightforward study, ask, answering the question who is Mystery Babylon? So between today and this coming Thursday, I want to show you who Mystery Babylon is, not according to someone's musings and putting together a history with their own private interpretation of Scripture. I want to do it singularly from Scripture, the, the proper and honest exegesis of Scripture as to the identification of Mystery Babylon. And I'll tell you this. Rome is not Mystery Babylon. Nope. Rome worked in cahoots with Mystery Babylon. That's true. But Rome is not Mystery Babylon. You say, well, who is Mystery Babylon? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Old Covenant, Jerusalem. 2,000 years ago. Fulfilled the prophetic declarations of Scripture concerning Mystery Babylon. I want to show you that. And if that contention is true, if I can prove that Mystery Babylon is Jerusalem, Jerusalem of the first century, then that necessarily does mean that the second coming took place in the first century in Christ's return to destroy Jerusalem in 70 AD. So, let's get right to it, because there's a lot here. My first question is, I always go about this about the same way, because years and years and years ago, I made a little outline on Antichrist and Mystery Babylon, and it works so perfectly. You know, that outline works for me. You know, I may state it different ways at different times, but it's just so simple, logical, and straightforward, but completely from the Scriptures. All right, step number one. Who is Antichrist, according to... The Bible's definition of Antichrist, and what is the religion, religion of Antichrist? They say, oh, I thought you were talking about Mystery Babylon. Well, they're connected, aren't they? Anti-Christianity and Mystery Babylon? Yes. 
Now, you can have questions about the man of sin and that kind of thing. I'm not going to get involved with that so much. I just really want to identify Mystery Babylon. But let's first start off with anti-Christianity, because Mystery Bob- Babylon is part of the anti-Christian system prophesied of in the book of Revelation and elsewhere. So, who is Antichrist, and what is his religion according to the Bible? Well, Antichrist is anyone that denies that Jesus is Israel's Messiah. Let me show you that. In 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, Say, Pastor, you still ch- turn changes? You still turn pages on a Bible? Yes, I do. I like doing it. I don't want to use a tablet for my Bible. I don't. Look, I'm used to my Bible. I can write in it. I know where everything is by looking, and it won't go south on me due to software engineers and the marketing schemes of those involved with everything digital. All right, First John two. <laughs> And verse 22 and 23. John writes, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? Let me stop there for a minute. Remember, you got to remember the word Christ, the Greek word is Christos, and it means the anointed one. What does that mean? It's referring to the one anointed to sit on the throne of David and govern God's nation, Israel, and has a specific reference to the Messiah. There's no theologian that I'm aware of, no matter what eschatological background he comes from. He can be pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, preterist, premillennial, post-millennial, amillennial, whatever. Everybody acknowledges that the word Christ is referring to the Messiah, Israel's Messiah, the one who is anointed to sit on the throne of David. You do realize the kings that sat on David's throne were anointed to that. They received anointing, and they were called by God. Jesus is the anointed one, the ultimate one to sit on David's throne to establish that eternal, everlasting, never-ending kingdom. That's the Messiah of Israel. Everybody agrees on that. All right. Who is a liar? But he that denieth Jesus is the Christ. He, they deny that Jesus is the Messiah. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. So understand the doctrinal belief of Antichrist at its core, the definition of Antichrist is he denies that Jesus is Israel's Messiah. Now I got to tell you, the Roman Catholic popes as far as I'm aware, I have never denied that Jesus is Israel's Messiah. They do not deny that Jesus is the Christ. Oh, they got a whole slew of problems, really bad ones. But the Roman Catholic Church does not deny that Jesus is the Christ, okay? Judaism denies that. In fact, Their faith is almost built on that singular premise, a negative. Jesus is not the Messiah. They are emphatic. Well, who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Messiah. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. May I also say that Judaism denies there is any such Father and Son relationship in the Godhead. They don't acknowledge the Godhead. They say, oh, there's only God. Well, there is only God. God in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. They're not three different entities. They are one. Now, we say God in three persons. <sighs> Look, to try and define the Trinity is beyond human ability. So I'm very leery about using definitions. I believe that in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, I believe when Jesus was being baptized, God the Father spoke from heaven. Jesus the Son was right there, and the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. And I believe those distinctions are there, and yet they are one. How is that true? I don't know. I'm just like you. (laughs) I have to take this stuff by faith, and I do. So, Antichrist, by definition, 
denies that Jesus is the Messiah, and they deny that there's any such thing as a son of God. Well, Judaism fits perfectly. Roman Catholicism does not, because they don't deny either one. You can't get around that. You can't get around that. You say, well, well, I've studied all these books and this historical stuff, and it's Rome that's Mystery Babylon. You can't, wait a minute, you can take all that stuff, if all of it, all that study you've had of what the Roman Catholic Church did here and there, nasty stuff, I know, but if it contradicts just one verse of Scripture, then your understanding is wrong. I'm going with the Scripture. Antichrist denies that Jesus is Israel's Messiah, and Antichrist denies that there is a Son of God. There is no father and son relationship in the Godhead. Well, Judaism fits the bill, okay? I just wanted to get make that plain. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. 1 John 4, verses 1 to 3. John writes, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. They are gone out. They were already gone out in John's day. Hereby ye know, hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ, now Christ is not Jesus' last name. When he says, whenever you see the Bible, Jesus Christ, what you're really being told is Jesus the Messiah. That's what Christ means, the Messiah. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus the Messiah is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus the Messiah is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Whereof ye have heard that it should come. And even now, already, is it in the world. Whoa. (laughs) uh, You're paying attention, right? Wow. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, is come in the flesh. If you deny that Jesus is the Messiah, and that he came into the world in human flesh, then you're not of God. And if that's your belief, and that's Judaism, that is the spirit of Antichrist. Well, should that surprise us? Because back in uh, 1 John chapter 2, in verse 22, he defined Antichrist as denying that Jesus is the Christ. So everyone that denies that Jesus, the Messiah, has appeared in human flesh in the first century, they have the spirit of Antichrist. Whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Wait a minute. The spirit of Antichrist was in existence in the first century when John wrote. Correct. Hmm. Could that be a clue as to when Antichrist and Mystery Babylon were operating? Could that mean that maybe they actually did come in the first century? Well, what do you think? All right, now I'll give you one more. Second John chapter, what chapter? <laughs> Second Hill, one chapter. Second John, verse seven. John writes, "For many deceivers are entered into the world, who confess not that Jesus is come in the flesh, that Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist." Whoa. So, there are many deceivers in the world who confess not, they deny that Jesus is the Messiah and that he's come in the flesh. Those people are deceivers and they're antichrist. Second John, verse 7. Antichrist denying Jesus as the Messiah. All right, so it's pretty plain from these three texts. They all agree perfectly. You couldn't put it in plain language. How could you state it more plainly? The definition of anti-Christianity is denying that Jesus is the Messiah and connected to that and that he's the Son of God. Well, that puts it in the camp of Judaism. Now, if you want Antichrist, 
and Mystery Babylon still in our future. And you're going to say that, well, when the Lord returns in the future, he's coming to save Jerusalem. Really? But wait a minute. Jerusalem would be the hotbed of anti-Christianity if it's in the future. Hmm. Could this be referring to the first century Jerusalem? And the Jews as they existed then in their denial of Christ? I don't know how it couldn't be. Well, let's move on. So we know the doctrine and the religion of Antichrist. He denies that Jesus is the Messiah and that he's the Son of God. Well, we're talking about Babylon. I'm not so much interested in the concept of Antichrist, but I wanted to lay that basic framework down. Let's talk about Babylon, because that's my subject. Who is Mystery Babylon? Mystery Babylon is a city. Okay? It's not a person. It's a city, according to the scripture. It represents the city from which anti-Christianity will emanate. What city does Babylon represent? Because Mystery Babylon is a symbolic designation. It isn't actually, literally Babylon. But what city does Mystery Babylon represent according to Scripture? Now, this is very powerful. Please pay, pay, pay close attention and look these scriptures up in your Bibles. I'll tell you, Mystery Babylon is guilty of murdering the prophets. I'll show you that. Of murdering the saints. I'll show you that. Of murdering the apostles. I'll show you that. They are guilty of all the righteous blood shed on the earth. I will show you that. And when we conclude all of those things, there's only one conclusion possible after who Mystery Babylon can be, and that would be Old Covenant Jerusalem. Now let's show you that. Let's start with Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. All right, Revelation 17, and um, we start at verse 4. Now, this is the, uh, I'm not going to read as much as I could. This is about Babylon, okay? Mystery Babylon. You can read the whole context, but I'm just going to pick it up at verse 4. And the woman who portrays Mystery Babylon, okay? The mother of all harlots. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Well, I guess I could read. I could have read before. Let me go back to verse 1, for those that might not be that familiar with the scriptures and this stuff. Verse 1, And there came out of the seven angels, and there came one of the seven angels, which had seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. The great horror is Mystery Babylon. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw the woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. You've got the beast, but then you've got Mystery Babylon who sits on top of the beast. We're talking about Mystery Babylon here. That's our subject. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. So that's what it said on this woman's forehead. It said, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. There's no question this woman here is the portrait of Mystery Babylon, and Babylon is a portrait of an actual city. All right, next sentence, verse 6. And I saw the woman, Mystery Babylon, drunken with the blood of the saints. What do you think that means? 
it means she is guilty of murdering the saints. The woman was drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. She's guilty of murdering people because they defended and stood for Jesus Christ. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. All right? All right, so that gives us some information. Um, All right, that's Revelation 17. And then jump down to verse 18. And the and st- the whole chapter is about Mystery Babylon. I'm skipping all the things in between because I just want to make the identification. Verse 18, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. You say, but you're going to say Jerusalem in the first century reigned over the whole world? No, that's not what it's saying. I'll get back to that a little bit at another time. But no, that's not what it's saying. It reigns over the kings of the earth, spiritually. All right, so, okay, let's go to the next text. Revelation 18, and this is a doozy. It's still speaking of Mystery Babylon, and uh, I don't want to, um, I don't want to read any context. You can read it yourself. The whole, it just goes on about Mystery Babylon. Anybody that reads it can figure that out. But just for time's sake, because I'm running short in time, verse 24, Revelation 18. No one's going to, no one's going to challenge me that verse 24 of Revelation 18 is talking about Mystery Babylon. I just want you to let, look it up yourself. If I get another time, I'll, I'll read it more context. And in her, in Mystery Babylon, was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that was slain upon the earth. Whoa. Okay, now wait a minute. Mystery Babylon is guilty of the blood of the prophets. It says, and in her was found the blood of prophets. Now, Mystery Babylon is a city. That city is guilty of murdering the prophets. But I got to tell you something. The Roman Catholic Church did not murder the prophets. Neither did Baghdad under Saddam Hussein. Old Covenant Jerusalem murdered God's prophets. There is no other option. In her was found the blood of the prophets and of saints. You say, what about that all that was slain upon the earth? We'll have to get to that next time. She murdered the prophets. Let me read one more here. Revelation 18.20. Again, still talking about Mystery Babylon, that great city. Verse 20. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. So wait a minute. The apostles are to rejoice because God hath avenged them by destroying Mystery Babylon. Now, who were the, who, where did the chief antagonism come from that caused the death of the apostles? It wasn't Rome. It was Jerusalem. It was, it was the uh, unbelieving cadre of Jewish fanatics in the first century under the rule of the scribes and the Pharisees. And even when Rome got involved with beginning to persecute Christians, it was at the instigation of a, 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 a Jewish entourage that was sent to Rome saying, now listen, Nero, you know, you don't want to take the blame for the burning of, of, of Rome. Blame it on the Christians. And these, these Jewish leaders were helping Nero, the, a beast of a man, if I can give you a little hint there, get out from underneath the outrage, because while Rome burnt, Nero fiddled and did nothing. And now there's an outrage. They said, we know who you can blame. So there's a working together of Rome and Jerusalem in the first century against God's people. But the apostles are to rejoice because they are avenged when Mystery Babylon is destroyed. And the prophets are to rejoice. Now, listen, friends, there's only one city guilty of killing the prophets, and that's Jerusalem. When we come back Thursday, I will show that to you hardcore. And there'll be no escaping this truth. And that will mean of necessity 
that the whole scenario of the tribulation of the beast and the men of sin and mystery Babylon, which leads up to the, the return of Christ, all took place in the first century, like Jesus said. Well, look, my time's up. I've got to go. Jim Gallagher reminding you in the words of our blessed Lord and Savior, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free.